George Washington University and is director of the Research Center for Genetic Medicine at Children's National Medical Center. He also serves as principal investigator of a National Center for Medical Rehabilitation Research um, network entitled NCMRRDC Core Molecular and Functional Outcomes Measures in Rehabilitation Medicine and is scientific director of the 24 site cooperative International Neuromuscular Research Group. I think that's enough. <laughs> you don't want me to talk about no. your focus on muscular dystrophy no. and genetics? Um, okay, I'll just start. Um. <laughs> okay. Once again, we're thrilled to have Dr. Hoffman here. Please help me. Help me. Right. Yeah, you did, you did write that, Danny. Please help me to welcome no. Help me. <laughs> Um, so um, I, I met uh, Florence when uh, we were <laughs> together for the, um, the um, oh, a meeting of the K-12 that you guys participated with. Uh, and so I'm the external advisor board for that. And um, it's a, a pleasure to be here. I also combined it with the Soul of the Capital, which is uh, a great part, which is a, a, a great thing. If, you, if it's still going, it's, I think it has one more week on that, doesn't it? But it's uh, different universities build houses, uh, men's and their houses. So um, um, I run this uh, NCMRR um, infrastructure network. So I'm one of, I think, seven sites. And the sites are all very different. And uh, some do robotics, some do uh, data mining. Ours is focused on omics supply to medical rehabilitation um, research. And what we generally help with is it's an R24. So we don't do research ourselves in the context of this. We only help others do it. So, um, and one of the things I'd like to do is sort of advertise this to you here because really we're there to help uh, the national and also worldwide rehab community. And so we have, give assistance with experimental design, data generation. Most of ours is uh, focused on uh, omics, so anything from microRNAs, messenger RNAs, epigenomics, proteomics. But we also help with preclinical and clinical outcome measures. As was mentioned, I'm the scientific director of a large international uh, neuromuscular clinical trials network called Synergy, CI Energy, and uh, as, a, as because of that, we do a lot of outcomes research. And we also do preclinical in terms of drug development, where you do mice mostly, and also dogs to some extent, where you do drug trials on mice to see what improves them clinically. That ends up becoming a more and more important part of drug development, particularly in orphan disease and rare disease, is you have to show preclinical efficacy in addition to toxicity. Um, so what this is just the outline of what I'll present. I'll try to give you sort of a, uh, a tasting menu, I guess. Um, one thing I'll spend some time on is biomarkers, and particularly genetic modifiers, in this case of monogenic disease. In all of your work, you have patients that respond and those that don't respond so well. So you have your responders and non-responders. And I think a key issue is, you know, in doing any intervention, that creates so much variability that how do you know what works or not? How do you prove in the, some interventional setting? So what, what, what I'll show you is how we try to get, sort of get a grip on what's the underlying cause of patient response, so variability to an intervention, and give you some stories of where we've nailed that down in some instances. Uh, metagenomics, also called microbiome type research, is the whole interaction of you with uh, bacteria that live in and around you. So as most of you know, there's more bacteria sitting there than there is actually of you. So ba bacteria outnumber your cells by about 10 to 1. So if you look at your neighbor, you actually have more bacteria than you are a person. Um, so we'll, we're talking about a project run through our core looking at uh, spinal cord injury and urinary colonization. And that was in collaboration with Suzanne Grode at the National Rehabilitation Hospital. And then uh, just a bit in the end talk about therapeutics because in any sort of rehab, if you can actually cure the patient, that would be great. Um, and so we'll talk about, I, I don't have time to talk about this one, but the systemic modulation of messenger RNA splicing. So one of the diseases I'll focus on is the Shen muscular dystrophy. Many of you have seen patients with this disorder. Just, um, it's the most common monogenic disease. Um, it's uh, equally frequent worldwide. It's excellent recessive, mostly males. Um, 
Uh, you can detect patients from birth just from a blood spot um, with this high serum creatinine kinase, which is basically a muscle blood in the gut. It, muscle gut blood, <laughs> muscle guts in the blood. Uh, so you can do neonatal screening. It's not currently done because there's no therapy able to be implemented in neonates. Really, in prednisone or glucocorticoids, which I'll come to later, is the standard of care, but a lot of side effects. And people really don't want to prescribe it until they're symptomatic because of breast stunting, endocrine, mood changes. So as a result, since you can't do anything, if you detect children at birth, you don't screen at birth. Presentation is generally with early school years with difficulty keeping up with peers, typically trouble with stairs, never breaking into a run. That then leads to progressive muscle weakness and loss. Typically loss of ambulation around 10 years of age, loss of activities of daily living around 15 years of age, and often patients will succumb to the disease in the late teens and must ventilate. Um, ventilated now patients can be maintained for many years. In Denmark, for example, patients really don't die of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But again, the social systems are such that it really provides <coughs> tremendous support for the patient in, uh, in a, uh, on a ventilator. As I mentioned, daily glucocorticoids are standard of care. They provide a relatively acute increase in strength and uh, about a two-year delay in loss of ambulation. Um, but because of the side effect profiles, they're only prescribed for about 50% of patients in the US. And it really depends by country to country whether people use with the corticoids. Cardiac involvement is also involved. So what I'll start off with is data from this Cooperative International Neuromuscular Research Group. Uh, I helped set this up about 15 years ago. And, and uh, well, it's all elected uh, executive committee. But I serve as the scientific director. Uh, Paula Clemens is the medical director, and I have talked around as the data and coordination. Um, one of the studies I'll point out was led by uh, Craig McDonald at UC Davis. So he was the study PI, and I'll talk a bit about that, that data. But here are the um, recruitment sites. We've added another about four or five sites, so I think we're up to about 27 now. So this was um, Craig McDonald as the study PI. It was 347 patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, all molecularly confirmed. Then followed over five years, we've extended it to eight years now. And the outcomes, there's this whole huge battery of tests done on all sorts of outcome measures. But um, what we're looking at is loss of strength, mobility relative to peers, extensive interpatient heterogeneity. And here we're seeing that heterogeneity. So a normal child, this is looking at the 10 meter walk run velocity, you can see they gradually get better with age, and here the age is 0 to 15 years. But you see Duchenne muscular dystrophy decline, and that difference with peers becomes greater and greater. Though even at presentation, you see they're about half of what normal children are. And so if you lose like the Bailey uh, 3 motor development, first motor development, you get about a score of half of what normal children are at that same, same time at presentation, just at, even at three years of age. And you can see that the charting the progression of each patient, it's really quite variable. I mean, sure, they generally decline, and they lose ambulation with time. These are all patients that have lost ambulation. But the question is that this, this heterogeneity, where you have mild Duchenne and severe Duchenne kids, really complicates clinical trials. And how are you going to find a drug that works if you don't know what's going to happen to a patient anyway? because there is so much patient-to-patient vari -patient variability. So what is the basis of this heterogeneity or clinical variability between patients? So one uh, aspect of that, now you guys better than me can identify all sorts of variables. Physical therapy, how well that's done, how much it's adhered to, casting versus stretching, on all sorts of variables. Even environment and diet, this, whether you're using steroids or not, there's lots of variables that you guys know about. But one that is often cited is genetic modifiers. So genetic modifiers, if you look at each of us, we're different from each other. And in fact, if you just look at muscle function, you can take some people and start a, a resistance training intervention. And some people gain strength very quickly, and some don't gain any strength at all. And that's a difference in the response of muscle to an intervention. So the theory is that these are common polymorphisms. They're not rare. They're not the patient's mutation. We're not talking about that. Talking about polymorphisms that exist in all of us, often called SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms, that modulate features of, in this case, a monogenic disease. But you could search and replace anything there from a, from a 
speech therapy intervention to anything, but there's different genetic modifiers modifying that patient's response to the intervention. So it can uh, modify onset, severity, progression of drug or intervention responsiveness. And so why are genetic modifiers interesting? So let's just assume you can find a robust genetic modifier. This is a single letter change in a 3 billion base pair genome that's common throughout all of us, but clearly modifies this disease strongly. Okay, that's what I'm calling a robust genetic modifier. Well, if you find those, they point to key aspects of molecular pathophysiology. So that I mean that SNP, that little change, alters some gene or protein in the genome. You know, that's not, say in this case, dystrophin or dystrophin gene, but some other gene. Well, by definition, if that's really a genetic modifier, that protein coded by that gene is important in the pathophysiology of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It's responding to muscle damage or muscle repair or drug responsiveness and altering that in some detectable way because it's a robust genetic modifier. You've detected it. So for uh, the gene or protein harboring the SNP is therefore important. And also it can be used to reduce variance in interventions. If you can then put this as a, a modifier, a, a covariate in your statistical models of an intervention, you're functionally reducing variance in your population. So you can more cleanly see what the effect of your intervention is, more sensitively see that. So it can be used to reduce variance in clinical trials, greater statistical power, and that results in less subjects and less cost, greater sensitivity of the trial. So here, we're going to switch to DMD and try to find these. So we know that patients are variable in onset and progression. We also know that they're variable in response to steroids. If you ask any physician, there are steroid responders and non-responders. Seems to be a balance of side effects and efficacy. So here we use this cooperative international neuromuscular group. We're going to talk about 340, the average, um, studying those for eight years, over eight years. And this was a collaboration with a second cohort with Elena Pegarao in Italy. This was 105 patients that she followed for the entire lifespan, from birth to sort of grave. And um, I'll talk about a, another cohort at the end of 1,300 college student volunteers, a population-based study that helped us define what these genetic modifiers were doing. Now, the reason that we had two DMD cohorts is in genetic modifier studies, it's generally quite important to have a, a test set, test data set, and a validation data set. There's a lot of signal-to-noise problems. You know, to give you one example, you, we just did with UCLA um, 3 million SNPs on the same cohort using a SNP chip. Well, if you actually adjust for multiple testing, you'll never find anything, right? Because you just did 3 million independent tests. So what you do is you use the 3 million SNP chip as a discovery tool in a discovery cohort. You peel out those that are most significant and immediately apply them to a validation cohort. That gets rid of your multiple testing problem because now you've limited it just to a couple of SNPs that you're testing in the new cohort. Okay, so generally, if you don't see a test and validation data set and SNP studies, the study is in trouble. And you shouldn't believe it very much. Um, so let's go over what we found. So what we started it left with was 19 candidate SNPs. Now these were ones that we and others had found that were already associated in normal populations, normal volunteer populations, with muscle strength, strength, size, response to resistance training, inflammation, metabolism, like type 2 diabetes. As I mentioned, we used a two-cohort design, a test cohort, a validation cohort. In our first run, this was early in the synergy study, so about 100 patients each. Now our phenotypes were not identical, and this becomes a problem with any validation. I mean, when you're doing a test set and a validation set, are your phenotypes you're scoring identical? Did you follow the same SOPs? Did you have the same evaluators? All that gets challenging you know, to find exactly the same thing. So I'm gonna make this a little mushy initially and <coughs> clean it up in the end. So we made things in the end. Um, steroid, we already know that steroids work, but the regimens are all over the place. There was just a paper last summer from a um, big international consortium and I think they found 30 different steroid regimens used in Duchenne patients. Week, high dose weekend, every other day, 10 days on, 10 days off, low dose, high dose, you know, do drug holidays, there's so many things that, and that, that complicates these studies. So what we found, and I won't, I'll just go over a bit of the background data from this paper that's already a bit old, is we found one of these that validated in both cohorts. And this is a gene called osteopontin. It's an inflammatory cytokine. 
it's involved in all sorts of disease processes, everything from arthritis to cancer progression. And so this was the first paper on that. Let me just show you the data from this. So Elena and her cohort studied loss of ambulation. So this is your sort of survival plot for loss of ambulation. And what she found is that there were, this is a, a single uh, nucleotide change. Us in the room, we either have TT, which is the most common, because we have two alleles, one for mom, one for dad, so you always see pairs, right? You're, so this is homozygous for the T, which is the ancestral, is the same as monkeys. It's right in the promoter of the gene, it regulates the gene. But then some of us have a G there, either as a heterozygous or as a homozygous. And I'll talk about actually what that, that single change does to the gene itself later, but it, it does stuff, okay? So we'll talk about that in a second. But the point here is that the, if you had either a GT genotype or a GG genotype as a Duchenne child, you're more severe. You lost ambulation about two years earlier than did the TT. And that was highly statistically significant, okay? Now, unfortunately, this was early in the synergy study, so we didn't have much loss of ambulation data. This is where your phenotypes get mushy, right? Because just we hadn't followed them to loss of ambulation yet. They were still, we had, I'll show you, we did later. But So what we did have was strength. So we can at least make the hypothesis that strength is a surrogate for loss of ambulation. A little mushy, but let's try. So when we did that, we found a very significant drop in strength with this GG. GTGG genotype, so it at least goes the same direction. In other words, these patients are more severe because they both lose ambulation and they're weaker. Okay, so this was close to a validation. Okay, in the sense that at least it's the same SNP, it's the independently uh, altering the disease. So then, the, uh, what we've done more recently, and from now on, I'll just show published data, is really. Can we validate the loss of ambulation data? So as I said, with these 347 patients we now have recruited in, in this UC Davis Synergy study, we had loss of ambulation data after many years for a lot of them. So let's just go back into that. So additional years, more patients followed longitudinally, more loss of ambulation. We had a larger number of subjects can begin. And then this is the key thing. We can start with a lot of subjects. You start stratifying or putting into your statistical model possible covariance. And one of them is steroid use. Because remember, that wasn't stratified in the previous cohorts. Now, I should, I'll, I'll give you a, a hint though that Italy, 100% of patients use steroids. So they were really all just steroid treated. Again, it varies by country and by. And so a postdoc, Luca Bello, in my lab, and a cancer surrogate postdoc, statistician, Heather Dressman, graduate student, Joya um, Gunefa, and Craig McDonald, who's the study PI and the synergy group is responsible for what I'm showing here. So when we went back and looked, first of all, you really have to define what you mean by loss of ambulation. Because again, you know, if you have steroid use all over the place, give us some definitions. So what we did was patient and family reported continuous wheelchair use with no change in subsequent follow-up visits. And these were annual or semi-annual visits. Um, then we had to define what steroid treated means. Again, because of sort of standard of care with no standard of care. So we defined it as at least one year of protracted steroid therapy with prednisone, prednisolone, or deflazacort. Have you guys heard of deflazacort? So it's not approved in the US, but basically there's a big traffic over the Mexican border and Canadian border, mostly for Duchenne. It's a modification, seems to have less of a bone loss, uh, a side effects associated with the other steroids. Um, use a slightly higher dose, but it's, it's really, um, a lot of US patients are now on it, even though it's not approved. Um, wholly before loss of ambulation. So we had to have at least one year before loss of ambulation. Steroid untreated we defined as no treatment or treated less than one year. Average in untreated groups is about 0 0.1. So this was a fairly clean distinction. So then we ran the SNP across this. And what we found was sort of not very encouraging. I mean, what we saw here was sure they were a bit um, earlier loss of ambulation. But it didn't quite hit uh, significance, even though we were up close to 200 patients with loss of ambulation. Okay, and so here's just the same survival plot. Again, it's the same trend, but it's a 0.07. Okay, so this is what starts to worry you. I mean, how much was that original real, or are we really validating it or not? 
But in the synergy cohort, there's a trend towards early loss triangulation that carries the risk of no statistical significance. But where the statistical significance came in when we stratify for steroids. So if you stratify for steroid use now, you see that those that are untreated here, well, no, this is, I'm going to get myself out of here. This is all genotypes. No, no, this is steroid. I'm going to get myself out of this slide again. Um, so yeah, so this is your, um, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> this is all genotypes treated. So you have, um, if you limit it to steroid treatment, you get your significance back considerably. So this is your uh, uh, G, G genotype with lower, uh, earlier loss of ambulation. Now, this is just the TTs alone and the TTGGs alone. Um, but again, I think the bottom, <laughs> I don't know why I'm so disoriented by this slide. I knew it last time I presented. <laughs> but um, the bottom line is if you stratify by steroid use, that's when you get a lot of statistical significance in back, where if they're untreated altogether, you lose that uh, statistical significance. And so here's just doing your law of rank again. This is all patients versus steroid treated, and here you're log rank of your sort of survival analysis of loss ambulation looks very much like Eleanor Pegararo's original data, in fact with the same significance, same two years difference. Um, the difference being that hers were all steroid treated and these are all steroid treated. So it excluded the non steroid treated. Okay, so now I'm just going to get into a bit of the biology of what this does, so at least we're validating at this point. So OPM levels, the levels of this protein, so the SNP is in a gene called the osteopontin gene, and that protein from that gene is really high in the strip of muscle, astronomical levels. If we look at just your muscle in this room, we have basically undetectable osteopontin. But as soon as you make dystrophic muscle, there's just a lot of it. Right? So it's a kind of inflammatory cytokine, muscles having trouble. But it's also quite volatile. If we try to take biopsies from patients and stratify for that same genotype, we really don't see differences, but there's such huge variation from patient to patient that we can't really see anything. The SNP, the actual polymorphism, and I'll go over this more in subsequent slides, is a loss of an SP1 transcription factor binding site with an 80% loss of transcription and promoter assays. What this means is where the SNP is, you have the two variations, either G or T, and many of us in this room have it, it sits just upstream of the gene, about 66 base pairs upstream of the structural genomics of protein. And if you have the ancestral T allele, like chimpanzees and other species, this makes lots of osteopontin. If you have the G allele, it seems to kill the promoter, so you're making 80% less osteopontin. Okay, now right there, some of you might, like we were, be a little confused. If this is an inflammatory cytokine, right? Wouldn't you think that having a lot of it is bad, right? But what we're saying is the G allele, which makes you worse, is less osteopontin. It kills the promoter. So we were, the, right there, we were really struggling with coming up with a model, because it was counterintuitive on what the SNP was doing to the gene. Um, this is just a mouse experiment where we took normal mice, just induced some muscle damage, and so they're using a snake venom. And it just degenerates and regenerates. It takes two weeks for your muscle to regenerate. But you see, this is the time frame here. This is about two weeks here to a month. And you see within one day, osteopontins just shoot hundreds of fold high. But then it gradually declines as the muscle repairs. Okay, so it's clearly involved in muscle damage and repair. So then we moved to this other cohort to try to tease out what the SNP was doing. And this was 1,300 college volunteers. So we had an NIH-funded study where we recruited 1,300 college kids, and we population based and we did a one arm 12 week supervised aggressive resistance training intervention with MRI pre post and uh, all these genetic measurements and we looked at both baseline uh, size and strength and response to the intervention and then we looked at genetic modifiers of that. Okay, so we ran this SNP across those phenotypes and what we found was not you think it might be involved in a response to training Maybe because it might involve some damage. We didn't see that. What we saw was it associated with baseline muscle size, but just in females. And so this is an enormous difference. Ten times 
uh, p at 3 times 10 to the minus 5th, a 15 to 17% difference. Which means that basically, if you just do an MRI of women in this room, or we need more than you to show that. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but if you have the one genotype, the wild type, okay, this is the wild type, same as chimpanzee, your muscle is going to be 20% smaller than your neighbors that have this genotype. That's one of the biggest SNPs that's been found as far as effect size. But only females. Now, how does that make sense? Particularly when Duchenne is male. One thing that I should tell you is osteopon is known to be estrogen responsive. It has the estrogen response promoter element in it. So that might be a thing. But it also doesn't really go back and explain this whole issue of more or less osteopon. Remember, this is more osteopon. This is less osteopon. Why would less osteopon give you such bigger muscle? So that, then we have to start looking at the gene and the promoter itself. And I think I'll show you in the next few slides that I think we've resolved all this. Um, here's the gene and the exons of the gene. So this is the protein coding sequence, the blue. And so here is this SNP. So SNPs are given an RS number. So this is the SNP we're talking about. And the T allele is the wild type. And as I mentioned before in the slide, we and others have shown that if you have the wild type, this transcription factor plunks onto the gene, binds tightly, and mediates gene transcription. So you end up with a lot of gene transcription shown by that out. Okay, now if you have this G, which is the less common alleles, 30-40% of alleles, um, what we did is hypothesize that maybe that's blocking somehow the SP1 binding site. It's known to block it. But the key thing is, why are we getting more transcription when, in fact, we've shown that you get less transcription? So somehow we have to see what these uh, estrogen and glucocorticoid response elements that are upstream of the gene. And remember, this is a step glucocorticoid responsive SNP in the Duchenne cohort, right? And because it's only females in our population-based studies, maybe it's involved with this estrogen, which is right next to it. So we have both, you know, there's a connection in the promoter of glucocorticoid response in Duchenne and an estrogen response in normal females, at least in the promoter saying they're both there. Okay? So what we did is our kid, our postdoc, made constructs and we started transfecting these. And so what we found, um, oh, I was going to replace this last time. I didn't know. So we confirmed in muscle cells, these are normal human skeletal muscle cells, what other people have presented for other cells like HeLa cells or kidney cells, that if you have the wild type sort of T allele, you make a lot of the transcript. If you have the G, you don't. Okay, so it's the same in muscle cells. But the key thing was this, when we added estrogen to those same reporter construct, this is the T allele. If anything, estrogen made it decrease. But this is the G allele. We got a threefold increase in estrogen response. Okay, so what this SNP does is sort of block the effect of the uh, enhancer elements binding these hormones. And so that's this model here. That with this G here, these elements, if glucocorticoids are around or estrogen around, they bind this upstream enhancers and are allowed to regulate gene through this SP1 binding site, causing more transcription. If the SP1 site is there because of the T, these, this effect is blocked. So if you have glucocorticoids or estrogen, it doesn't matter because SP1 is blocking it. So this actually builds the whole thing into a cohesive model, we think which is basically muscle damage induces SPP1. We know it's chemotractic for neutrophils. That's involved in inflammatory cell modulation, complex protein regulation. You have this binding site polymorphism. In the context of steroid hormones, either the corticoids or estrogen, the G allele gives you greater opium response to estrogen and prednisone. So the G in normal females, if you have eccentric activities, more opium, because this is mildly damaging, more recruitment of inflammatory cells and greater hypertrophy. It's exacerbating the hypertrophy response due to estrogen floating around. In males, it doesn't happen because there's no estrogen. In G allele and DMD boys, prednisone increases OPM, 
counteracts or blunts the anti-inflammatory response to glucocorticoids and adds to side effects of glucocorticoids. So we think this is brokering the side effects of glucocorticoids and blunting your ability to see efficacy. So we can test this model a bit. So what we did is, this is one of the first times I, I know of where we recruited normal volunteers of known genotype just to see if a model was right by inducing muscle damage. Okay, so this was, what we did was we genotyped young adult female volunteers, and we did an eccentric challenge. Does everybody know what eccentric, you guys what? Oh, okay, so eccentric, half of you do, half of you don't. Um, Except this two types of muscle contraction. Concentric, if you take a barbell, and you lift it against gravity. So your actin and myosin are contracting and shortening the muscle that raises the weight, okay? So everything's moving to shorten, okay? That's concentric. Eccentric is just going the other way, letting it slowly down against gravity. What happens is the same muscle is bearing the weight, but the actin and myosin is contracting inside the fibers while the outside of the muscle is stretching. Okay, so when the outside connective tissue in the cell is stretching, the inside's trying to contract to resist that, you start ripping up plasma membranes because the shear forces at the cell membrane. The inside's contracting, the outside's strengthening, they're, they're conflicting. So I mean, a, a typical anecdotal evidence of that is if people who have to be airlifted out of the Grand Canyon because they have rhabdomyolysis, it's from going down, not going up. So going down the Grand Canyon, it's constant eccentric activity where you're trying to break your fall. That messes up your, your muscle. It all goes necrotic. You end up with rhabdomyolysis. You start shutting down your kidneys from the myoglobin. And you have to be airlifted out. Okay. Whereas if you go up, you're okay. You're sore, but you're okay. <laughs> um, so we then did an eccentric challenge about 50 weights. What we did is we helped the girls up with the weight and asked them to let it down slowly. And we help them up with it, let it down slowly. We do that 50 times. Okay. And then what we do is longitudinal MRI. Whitney Barfield was the PhD student who, she was really a great. This was all about Howard University. And she's a Howard University PhD student and did a great job getting the studio out of these and everything. <laughs> and then Paul Wong and, uh, is the radiologist and Bernard Bond is the exercise physiologist. So we recruited these subjects and here I'm just showing you an example. So this is pre... Can you see it? It's pretty obvious actually. So this is pre and this is post. You see a bit of increased water content, you know, a bit of swelling because of the eccentric activity. Now this is in the GG, the wild type. If you do the GT, this is pre and this is post. Basically the whole muscle starts getting water compound inflammation all the way out into the subcutaneous fat. So it's inducing that inflammation into the fat. These girls were fine eventually. I just know <laughs> <laughs> and they were paid handsomely. <laughs> I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> so if we look at an isometric strength test on the exercise arm, we see a corresponding result to the swelling and inflammation. But basically, if you have a wild type, you, your strength deficit is not so great as if you have this G over So basically, the, what we can turn to now, the last part of this, is the effects of genetic modifiers in clinical trial design. Again, to review this from the beginning, phenotypic variation between patients increases statistical power, increases patient numbers needed for any intervention. Genetic modifiers may explain some part of this variation. Once explained, can be controlled for by adding to statistical models as covariate or limit enrollment to just one genotype. So you've narrowed your variation there. Um, and stratification, one thing people worry about, particularly in the context of drug development, is if you genetically stratify a population going into clinical trials, maybe the FDA will only approve you for that subset of patients with that genotype. That's probably true for common disorders, but for rare disorders it's not. It's pretty clear, they say that if you can extrapolate in rare disorders, they're much more lenient or forgiving in rare disorders. So that's, we're fine there. So what we did is, is look longitudinally, and, and uh, Tuli Kanan, the head of the board of stress and other statisticians doing this, and we just used sliding one year windows to this whole 357 patients. So, and then looked at, this is velocity, 10 meter velocity. And what you can see is that the TTs start off stronger but then decline, and the GGs start off weaker and then it's more slowly decline. 
If we plug that into statistical models to power clinical trials, say a 12-month intervention, um, what you end up with is the TTs you only need 25 per group, whereas the GGTT is 1,000 per group. So just, again, compressing variance and looking at that, that, that variance, you can really get a big difference in strut and power in clinical trials by adding or stratifying to them. Either adding it to your statistical models or stratifying to that. So here's just a summary. Genetic modifiers in DMD. Can be challenging in any disorder, the heterogeneity, phenotyping, heterogeneity, steroid use. I should mention we found, we found this one a couple months ago. This was reported by a different group, and we just found another one just the last couple months. All of these are now in the same TGF beta pathway. And what this is a general cell response to damage pathway. So it's part of your pro inflammatory. It's often associated with fibrosis and almost any organ system. So it seems like this pathway is important. Going back to one of the reasons to do this to begin with, we now know we should target that pathway with drugs. So the SPP1, I, I should, there's two names for osteopathy. One is SPP1 as well. Complex inflammatory cytokine and muscle. Promoter polymorphism differentiates response to steroids. Shown for estrogen. We're now testing it for prednisone as well. Um, the rare allele causes more damage, but greater hypertrophy in normal females. Rare allele increases with corticoid response, um, increases side effects, and again, we're proving that in vitro now, and significant changes in calorie clinical trials. So now what I'm going to do is move on to this next topic, which is this metagenomics. So this is an exemplar for mic microbiome studies. And you're starting to see microbiome a lot in the newspapers and science journals. And it basically, just to summarize here, so we'll feel bacteria were bad, and they were a small subset of bugs identified by <laughs> culturing. And you hit them all with antibiotics, try to wipe them all out. Okay? So this is now changing the sort of Republican view of bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Wait, but I am in California. <laughs> Bacteria are now a balance of good and bad, so symbiosis. You can identify all subtype types of bugs now via sequence. Remember in a cultured petri dish, you, know, you try to culture bacteria, you're only detecting like 0.5% of what's in there that will grow under those conditions. So now we see everything that's in there just by sequencing everything, seeing what's there. And what you can start to look at is the individualized balance in health and disease, and then targeting treatments to the individual and their balance, either to the specific nasty bacteria where you've identified it, instead of your broad spectrum antibiotics, or by even restoring, seeing how somebody's microbiome is out of balance and trying to restore it. So probiotics from a scientific viewpoint instead of a yogurt viewpoint. Um, so what I'm going to show is just a vignette of spinal cord injury, catheterization, morbidity. And again, Suzanne Groh was the, the leader of this project at National Rehab Hospital. So many SCI patients obviously are chronically catheterized. Chronic catheterization leads to chronic colonization. I should mention that even the patients that aren't catheterized show big changes in the microbiome. So what the colonization of the urinary tract is very different, even if they're not catheterized. That's because of the neuropathic bladder. And so whether it's neuropathic bladder plus or minus catheterization, either way you're changing the microbiome a lot. And I'll show you that. SCI patients have a shortened lifespan in part due to sepsis. So what happens is a UTI can become a chronic UTI that can start at some point at, at a kidneys and actually to the rest of the body and become sepsis. And so it's generally acknowledged that uh, SCI patients have about half the lifespan of controls at the same age. And it seems a lot of this due to sepsis, and a lot of that seems to come from the neuropathic lab. So what is the microbiome metagenomics associated with chronic catheterization or the neuropathic bladder? Is there a change in microbiome predictive of sepsis, and can new technologies be brought to routine urinary monitoring to watch that change in colonization of the urinary tract to try to prevent that? So, um, this is one of the, the, the worst abbreviations I've ever seen of a project. <laughs> Genito urinary microbiome of people with SCI, which somehow comes out to Genesis. <laughs> and I will blame Suzanne for that. 
Um, and it was also a collaboration with uh, Georgetown and the Jim Crow Institute. So it was run through a rehab grant that I was up about. So this is a pilot study of 57 subjects without urinary symptoms, 35 without SCI, and 32 with SCI, stratified by catheter use. In parallel, your standard urinalysis and urine culture were done, but then the experimental part was the metagenomics, so sequencing all the bacteria in there and looking at what they were. The results was about 600,000 different bacteria were sequenced, different reads, and then you can develop a taxonomy of that. So you just run it against databases and see what's in there. And so the summary of that is basically in healthy non-SCI, Lactobacillus <coughs> species or genus is the most common. So we all have bacteria, they're just not pathogenic to the point of urinary tract infection. And when we see bacteria, they're almost always these. But if we look at SCI, you see a switch to, in the neuropathic ladder, a switch to a different type of bacteria. So this is a, a genus here, and these different, um, there's a family and genus, is that right? <laughs> and so you see Asteria in there, Klebsiella, Proteus, and Salmonella all now taking over the neuropathic bladder urinary tract. <coughs> so we've now moved on to all sorts of interesting studies. Hans Pohl is helping with these as well, including to make sure that you're not introducing the bacteria from exit of the urine. So we now get volunteer males to be catheterized, and then we take urine from the bladder directly to make sure that we're not looking at contamination of skin bacteria. And then expanding into a lot more non-SCA. And, um, and actually, we're going to write, we're currently in the process of writing some of the quarry grant, and we're talking about some of the quarry hospital patient centers outcomes grants that are now through the ARA funding. Okay, the last few slides I'll just talk about a way to actually treat patients or therapeutics. And so, in this case, what we're going to look at is Duchenne muscular dystrophy again. So, this is dystrophin. So, dystrophin causes Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, I identified that protein, I think, going on 30 years ago now, 1987. And so it's, well, I was post-op in this temple. And so you see it's part, this is muscle and cross-section, so here's your myofibers. And you see it's around the plasma membrane, it's part of the membrane cytoskeleton. So in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, it's loss of function mutations of the gene. You have none of the protein, and you have lack of dystrophin. So one of the goals of therapy is to try to bring dystrophin back. Okay, so in the last few slides, I'm going to show you how we're going to try to bring these dystrophin back. So here is the dystrophin gene, and the largest gene known in the human genome. Here's a bunch of deletions and duplications. But the point here is we can find a whole other disease called Becker muscular dystrophy, which is a milder form of Duchenne. These are patients with mutations in the same gene, but the mutations are compatible with still making some protein, in this case much smaller, it's an abnormal protein but they're partial loss of function, not complete loss of function. So Duchenne is complete loss of function the protein. Becker is partial loss of function. Now what distinguishes those types of mutations? Here we've taken a series of Becker patients that were referred to us. We've mapped their deletions and duplications. And with that, this slide is only Becker. What you see is some patients are missing like almost half <coughs> of the genes, and they still have mild disease. And other patients have duplications that are very large, and they still have mild disease. The difference between the different mutations is a Duchenne patient can't put together what's left of their gene. It has to do with when you put together what's left, if you can maintain the reading frame, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, for the amino acids through the new junction, where the two pieces that weren't, didn't used to be next to each other are now spliced together. So that's called an out of frame mutation, because it's losing the protein reading. Beckers have what's called an in-frame mutation. They just by chance put together the remaining pieces and they still fit together nicely. They still maintain the 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3 over the new junction. And so that's why you see protein. Because they're missing amino acids corresponding to the missing exons, the deletion, but they can still make the protein. So this is a normal protein and a small protein. So the goal then of exon skipping is to do this turn Duchenne into Becker. So that's what I'm going to show you doing. This is in phase three clinical trials, and it's working, which we should probably look at. I'll go over that in a second. But basically, here's a schematic of a patient's cell. This is a normal individual. 
Here the nucleus is just a piece of the description gene, the subunit of the exon. So they have all the exons intact, and they splice them together to maintain the reading frame in the RNA and make the protein the protein stabilizes the plasma membrane. Okay? Now in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, this patient's only missing one exon, exon 50. So, but when that patient tries to splice together what's remaining, you see that these don't fit neatly together. So they, that's a frame shift. Okay, you've changed the reading frame. It can't make the protein, so you have a complete loss of function and membrane instability. Okay? So what we're going to do is come in with little drugs. These are little oligonucleotide drugs. We're going to go IV. Some of the trials are subcutaneous. They'll go in and we design them specifically to the patient's mutation to bind to the next exon and block it from being included. So in this case, this drug is now binding exon 51. It's blocking the inclusion of this exon into the RNA splicing. And what we've done is restore the reading frame. We've taken an out-of-frame mutation and converted it into an in-frame mutation. So Duchenne into Becker. Does that make sense? And so that then can make the stroke and it's missing some amino acids, but it's still there and still stabilizes the plasma. So this falls into the categories of antisense, or oligonucleotide <coughs> antisense. You're making a drug with a specific sequence to go and find its match, its base pairing, with its target. So generally it's targeted sense, your drug is antisense, and so that's why it's binding. Well, there's a long 20-year history of antisense drug development, and it's dismal. It's 90 clinical trials, 40 of them completed, over 2,000 patients treated, treated including cancer, inflammatory disease, and basically nothing's on the market. There's only one drug that was approved, but even this was taken off the market. It was for intraocular injection for CMP associated with AIDS, HIV. Um, so what are the problems and why, why do I say it's dismal when I'm saying this, I'm presenting this to you? Because I'm going to show you it works in Duchenne. And the chronic problems with this have been delivery barriers. To make those drugs, put them in the blood, and hope to get them into this target cell high enough concentrations to bind its targets has been hard. Okay. Um, target efficiency barriers, and then also toxicity. I mean, basically, whenever you take a nucleic acid and inject it into anybody, they, your body says, virus, right? And it's, it starts freaking out big time. And so it's, all this innate immunity starts going crazy because you don't like seeing a lot of nucleic acid floating around that you don't recognize. Probably means something bad. <laughs> okay. You're going to be one big virus baby unless you do something quick. Okay. So toxicity has been a barrier to these kinds of studies. Um, so what I'll show you is basically we've gotten over all of these for a couple of reasons. One is the the chemistry. So the key with chemistry is is to make this is your standard DNA. Remember, you have your ribose ring. This is a deoxy. You have your base GATC. <laughs> and your phosphodiester linkage. OK, RNA just has that OH on it. Now, what you, like I said, if you just inject either of those, it's just, you're just asking for trouble. So what you got to do is make more and more stealth drugs, drugs that look less and less to the body like a virus. And so what you do is start modifying the chemistry. Now this is the one that was just in the New York Times last week, in Duchenne Muscular Distribute at AR. It was actually the most remarkable thing. I don't know if you saw that. I was, I was in Europe at the time. It was even on the front page. It says, gene therapy shows promise. And I was wondering, what the hell is that about? So I go to the page, and there is my disease, Duchenne Muscular Distribute, and it was a phase three trial that completely failed. And that's what the story was about. Really? <laughs> so I think it's not even gene therapy. <laughs> it's it's oligonucleotide. I think they pre-wrote the story as if it was going to work, and then when it completely failed, they had to somehow switch it around. But it was crazy. They that was on this chemistry, and the problem with this chemistry is it's toxic still, and a lot of the patients had a lot. Everyone had inflammatory reactions. They could only go so acute with a limited amount, and the reason it failed is it. And it's the same thing that's plagued the previous trials. So what's currently being reviewed as far as uh, by FDA now is this chemistry, which we've put a lot of effort into. 
And so this chemistry, if you look, the whole ribose ring is now replaced with a morpholine ring. So see how this ring looks almost nothing like a ribose ring. But it maintains the intramolecular spacing from base to base beautifully. In fact, it increases the affinity for the target when it's all sequenced differently. And also, you notice the phosphodiester linkage is changed now to a nitrogen. Um, this is apolar, this is non charged. And that's another thing, so it doesn't start binding other proteins. The other thing is, this is not metabolized at all, it's secreted intact through the urine, actually, fairly quickly. But because it can't, it just is completely alien. Nobody, no body has ever seen any pro stru chemical structure like this. And because of it, it has no mechanism to metabolize it, recognize it as foreign, et cetera. So what I'll show you is just some uh, quick experiments with that. And this is dogs with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Now I should say these dogs were brought in by owners with the disease. We did not create these dogs in the laboratory, so don't burn down my lab. Okay, we're trying to help the dogs. We are. And so this is a dog at about six months. Oh, I have to run it off the USB. Oh, is it worth putting the USB? Yeah. How are we doing on time? Are we okay on time? That clock's wrong, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> what time is it? Oh, it's about 11. Oh, it's about 11. It's about half an hour. What? Is it late? No, no. Oh, we can throw it? Okay, so we can It's on the right. We have till 11.30, right? <laughs> Oh, and this is Japanese. So this was a collaboration with Japanese collaborator Shinichi Takeda. So this dog is seven months old. We're trying to encourage the dog to run. Um, and that's based, so he's treated with placebo. So they tire very quickly. A lot of the dogs have to be euthanized about a month or two after this. Now this litter mate was considerably more severe than this dog in first treatment. So this is after the oligonucleotide injection. Japanese for go go by <laughs> So if we look biochemically, it fits with the clinical picture. We did an MRI and all sorts of outcome measures. But we see that you know, there's no disturbance of the dogs before treatment. And we're bringing back variable levels, but we're bringing back a lot of disturbance. So that biochemically fits. So where do we stand with that? So the 2 primal methyl was just reported the phase three, as I mentioned. They had to go subcutaneous on this low level. Uh, because of the toxicity. This morpholino is much less toxic. We, I did studies um, for the IND up to one gram per kilogram <laughs> in mice and with no toxicity. So the, excuse me, the human trials are up to 50 mix per kilogram. You can go intravenous because it's not toxic. And so that, that now is in front of the FDA. So the kids objectively get a lot better. I mean, there's a mom who visited me last week who has two sons with Duchenne. And the one who's on the drug just keeps on getting stronger every day and doing more stuff he wasn't able to do before. Um, 
the whole thing gets into what's called biomarker studies and when you get it approved. And so that's the last few slides we're going to talk about because it's very relevant to OT, OT and PT too. So we get some impressive increases in the stroke from protein with variable. But one of the problems is quantitation of the stroke is problematic. So you have this big protein, you look at immunostaining, immunoblotting, and kind of be uh, variable from lab to lab. So what you really need is a qualification. So what that means in FDA parlance is that the FDA has moved a lot over the last year or two towards wanting to make faster, cheaper drugs. The reason is what's often quoted is to get one drug to market is $1 billion in 15 years. Now if you think about all what we're all doing in medicine these days, it's all individualizing everything, right? And part of that is even now, lung cancer is not lung cancer. It's different types, it's for two positive, or breast cancer, different substratifications. What that means is the different categories of disease get smaller and smaller in the number of people. And with that, the drugs get more and more specialized. But if you're really trying to spread one billion development costs across less and less people, it just shoots the drug costs to the roof and the whole thing becomes unsustainable. So we're at this position currently today of tremendous promise and of quick drug development that's very targeted and lots of things going through the pipeline, but not really clear how anybody's going to afford it because this, the, the whole le less and less people are being developed for. So to just give you an example of this morpholino that I just showed you, the company expects to charge 400,000 per patient per year. And it's a chronic treatment. So I mean, how are we going to afford that as an insurance healthcare system? <coughs> so one way to get it cheaper, the only way actually there's been studies of this how to make drug development cheaper is to reduce the time that it takes to develop the drug to the point where you can charge for it. And so what the uh, recent legislation has done is encourage the FDA to look, instead of, instead of your two independent phase three big trials prior to registration and selling marketing, move the time way up. Go to phase 2B, handfuls of patients, make sure they're blinded, but then use biomarkers. <coughs> use something in the muscle of the blood that you're absolutely convinced mirrors the disease in some way. So it's predicting future clinical outcomes. But now doing it early in the process where you get accelerated approval, also called provisional approval. So you get approval at that point you still have to do your prospective phase three, but it's post-market. It's after you're already selling the drug. So that should bring the cost down tremendously. So that's where this drug currently is in front of FDA under an accelerated approval based on dystrophin expression in muscle. And the FDA wrote back and said, you really have to tell me that those levels are compelling. You have to show, I believe you in the dystrophin, but your measurements are sort of suspect because immunoblotting and immunofluorescence are a little questionable. So what the last few slides is we developed a, a different argument. Oh yeah, so this is, I'm sorry. This kind of stuff. So what's often used in clinical trial outcomes is six minute walk test, the most commonly used, but it's very variable, it takes up a year to show improvement. So again, can you get more to the biomarker type of place to approve the drug? And so what our goal here is to use dystrophin protein as an efficacy surrogate endpoint. It is clinically relevant, but we need good ways of looking at it. We need a rapid analysis that will aid critical phase two, three assessments. So what we've done is just develop a new way to measure a lot of proteins. And that's the last slide I'm going to switch to that. Okay, let me just explain what we did because I want to some technical slides. What we need is a really accurate way to measure proteins in any tissue in human trials. So what we did was take a mouse. We fed them algae that had been grown in stabilized systems. So the entire mouse now had C13 instead of C12 throughout its whole body. Then we just bank all the tissues frozen. Then we take a little bit of that patient's muscle and we mix it with the human patient muscle in these trials. Okay? And then we mix them together and we run it on a gel so we find dystrophin area in the gel. Now, that most proteins are so well conserved between mouse and human that if you bust them up with trypsin into little fragments, which is what you do for proteomics, those peptides, you find a whole slew of them that are 100% conserved between mouse and human. Well, the mouse is labeled as stable, stable isotope, so it's a few <coughs> neutrons bigger than the human. So it shows up as a pair, which is shown in this slide right here. Where basically this is mouse 
one's mouse and one's human, and you can sequence these individually with a mass spec to make sure that it's broken. And so what we end up with is this. The R squared for this assay for dystrophin is R of 0.99 all the way down to single percentages. And what we can do is that for any protein. So we're currently doing it for other companies and stuff. Basically giving any tissue, any protein, we'll be able to quantify it using these Psylam labeled mice as the control for all the different proteins we're targeting. So what we're doing is taking that through the FDA as a qualification. So this is the process to do a biomarker qualification for the FDA. You do a conference call, cover letter, letter, and we kind of qualify review team. So we're up to this stage, and we're entering this with the FDA. But this would be the first mass spec assay for a biomarker for the FDA. And so they're really excited about it. And we're keen, because this would facilitate all clinical trials aimed at bringing back this person. So that's it. Um, I mentioned a lot of the collaborators along the way, but the dogs, our, our Japanese collaborators, were quite important in the famous group. Um, and the funding was Department of Defense, different foundations, uh, Foundation of Radicator Shen, Crystal Ball, MBA, uh, NIH 